Thank you, Stephanie, Malprops, everyone who's tuned in, and Christy, whose wonderful debut novel was released just last week. I'm going to start by reading a bit from What a Wonderful World This Could Be. Then I have some questions for Christy before she reads, and then Stephanie fields the audience's questions. It's 1969, the height of the Vietnam War protests. Alex, my main character, works as a darkroom technician for a newspaper and lives with her husband, Ted, in a political collective that's just been taken over by the radical group Weatherman. She and Ted want no part of Weatherman, but on the morning they're going to look for a new place to live, she wakes up with stomach flu. Later that day, the worst of the flu is over, and her friend Stacy has just brought her a Coke. Alex reached for her empty glass. Have you seen Ted? Stacy shook her head. Matt and I were up all night fighting, and then I crashed. Think you could eat some dinner? Alex's stomach shriveled, maybe a little broth. When Stacy was gone, Alex lay down again. She didn't have the energy to begin packing. Voices from the street came up to her as if someone had just turned on a radio. She heard the rattle of the downstairs door. Ted, or someone just going out? Had the collective met on it? Had a vote been taken? Stacy came back with a teacup full of bouillon chattering on its saucer. She set it on the floor. He's been busted. Leah took the call while you were asleep. It was not extraordinary news, but still. What for? Parking ticket. It was a favorite trip. The cops picked up someone for questioning and got around his right not to be held by charging him with a traffic violation. It didn't seem to matter that movement people always paid their tickets, never jaywalked or bounced checks, precisely to avoid the cops giving the cops an excuse to arrest them. Why didn't Leah tell me? Lighten up. You were asleep. She rephrased the question. What do they want to talk to him about? There was a break-in at the ROTC hut last week, remember? Disgusted, Alex stood. Stacy was sitting on the mattress when she came out of the closet, pulling a batik shift over her head. He wasn't even here last week. You might as well drink this broth. They're not going to set bail for a parking ticket. Maybe they won't hold him. Angrily, she picked up the cup. Yeah, and maybe they'll plant a lid. All year, Ted had been the one counseling restraint. Why was he the one they always arrested? It's a crock, Stacy said, as Alex flew downstairs to call Sandy, the house lawyer. The lawyer phoned her back. It was not a parking ticket, but a parking lot. Ted had been charged with leaving the scene of an accident after the police produced a note from a witness who swore to having seen their white Impala sideswipe a car at Hoots driving. At least it was a misdemeanor. It's a good thing they didn't happen to have a fresh hit and run victim lying around, she said tartly. Can I pick him up now? I'll pick you up, Sandy said. Can you come up with $500 cash? Tonight? Better call a bondsman then. When the Mercedes pulled up, Tulip protested that Alex had no right to leave the house without permission. Alex slid her eyes. I'm not a member of this collective. As long as you're living in this house, you are. Go to hell, Alex called over her shoulder. At the station, Sandy loaned her $50 to pay the bondsman, and they sat on a bench to wait. Dusk had fallen by the time Ted was released. At the sight of him across the room, she drew in her breath. It was as if the pressure in the air changed. Even with her eyes closed, she thought her skin would know when he was present. She kissed him, wishing she'd had time to take a bath. How do you feel, he asked. Better. How are you? He flashed a grin. Not guilty. Sorry, I didn't have time to find a place. They slid into the front seat of Sandy's Mercedes. I thank you for coming down, old man, but I'm beginning to think I'm paying for this boat, Ted said. Just the gas. Sandy smiled. He was a large man with a florid face and a long straggle of white hair thinning at the crown. On the wheels, his fingers looked powerful. The rich leather smell of the seats came up to her nostrils like the return of appetite. I'm hungry, she said. Sandy glanced at the clock. Where to? Anywhere but Hoots, Ted requested, and Alex felt so much better she laughed. 
Sandy's breath skimmed Alex's hair. That's an old scam. Guy needs some body work, so he goes to a parking lot, picks out a license, and gets two friends to write anonymous notes. The detective finds a worn spot on your bumper, and if he likes your looks, you just call your insurance agent. If he doesn't, you've left the scene of an accident. If you kids have any bumper stickers or piece decals on your vehicles, get them off. Not everyone believes in First Amendment rights these days. Alex turned to Ted. Stacy's joining Weatherman. I thought she would. Alex, Sandy cautioned, don't tell me anything. It's not against the law, Alex protested. The law, my dear, is 10% statute, 90% interpretation. Chasen, she stared at the lighted dial of the radio. Sandy turned the corner onto the strip of bars and head shops that stretched between the courthouse square and Wallace. Sammy's okay? Sandy slowed for a parking space. Sealed inside the air-conditioned Mercedes with the horns from the New World Symphony, watching the kids perched on the burnished hoods of the parked cars, Alex felt as if she were inside a hermetic bubble. It took her a full minute to pick out the reflection of the flashing blue lights. What the hell do they want? Sandy pulled over and reached for his wallet. The cop thrust his face down, ignoring the license and registration Sandy offered. I'd like to talk to your passenger. Sal Sandy folded his wallet. I'm an attorney at law, and my passenger is my client, who has just been detained for several hours. Get out of the car. Ted opened the passenger door. Don't you guys ever get tired of me? The officer stepped back without seeming to have heard, and Sandy opened his door. Alex scrambled after Ted. My client is free on bond. Unless you have a warrant for his arrest on an unrelated charge, you can't legally detain him for at least 24 hours. The officer took Ted's elbow. As Alex opened her mouth, Sandy shook his head. A knot of kids had gathered on the sidewalk. Inside Baskin Robbins, people were pressing their faces to the glass. Ted stared straight ahead as he was escorted to the car. Clear this sidewalk, the officer ordered. Pig, the crowd swelled. Near the entrance to the ice cream shop, a dog was licking the pavement. The officer stared coldly at Sandy. Tell your clients to disperse. My client is in your car. As his attorney, I demand to know what you intend to question him about. Move back, the officer commanded again. Clear this sidewalk now. Sandy inclined his head toward Alex. Take my car. Don't worry. This is illegal. I'll have him out in an hour. He reached into his pocket for the keys. It happened so quickly, Alex missed it. There was a gasp from the crowd, and Officer Church was holding his gun. Take your hand out of your pocket slowly and bend over the car. Anything you say, sir, Sandy muttered. A rock shattered the Baskin window's window, showering the sidewalk with glass and sending the crowd screaming, yelping the dog shot down the street. The officer spoke into his radio, and within seconds, another squad car screeched around the corner. Alex stood paralyzed while the other cops pursued the fleeing crowd. By the time the squad cars drove off, only Alex and the cursing manager of Baskin Robbins remained on the street. She bent to pick up Sandy's keys from the gutter. At the station, she was told they'd been charged with attempting to incite a riot. Bail would not be set until morning. It was after midnight when she got home and the collective was assembled in the living room. Their voices carried up the stairs. Matt's commitment to the revolution was weak. When the rank and file had called for the ousting of certain members of the steering committee, he had been silent. He had balked at giving up his dog. Alex caught a glimpse of him as she came through the hall, sitting in a straight back chair, eyes on the floor. Tell them to fuck off, she willed him from upstairs, but the litany droned on. In the morning, Alex called the courthouse, but the hearing wasn't scheduled until 10.30. She drove to the register. At 10, Irv strolled in. Get your camera, babe. Big Irv's gonna take you out today and show you how it's done. Full page spread, beating the heat. Photographs by Irv Stone and Alex Neal. How's that grab you? 
As a matter of fact, I was just on my way out. She picked up her bag, beating the heat. So it's not Life magazine. Little girl has got to start somewhere. Irv hoisted himself to the darkroom counter. Didn't know you were working part-time these days. Opportunity only knocks once, you know. Look, I don't mean to be a snob, all right? Another time, I have personal business. Hey, he jumped from his perch to follow her through the newsroom. Where are you going? To the courthouse. In the parking lot, he watched her dig in the bag for the keys and then inserted himself between her and the door of the Mercedes. Nice car. And it belongs to a friend, Irv whistled. My husband's lawyer, if you have to know. Impatiently, she plied the keys. His leer curved into an insinuating grin. You and hubby having trouble? Tell Big Irv. She glared at him and he moved aside, but held the door once she was settled in the car. Look, I have to go, she said, hands on the wheel. I'm just trying to be a nice guy, he protested. Well, you have no talent for it. She sighed. Go to the pool, Irv. Go find yourself a lemonade stand. I have to be at the courthouse. There's no story at the courthouse. Today's story's at the jail. She turned so sharply that she nearly bumped his head, thrust down inside the car. Gotcha. He closed the door and backed away, but she rolled the window down. Well, you work at a newspaper, he said, in the dark room by herself. What story? He squatted beside the car. Is your husband in jail, Alex? Yes. Better slide over and let me drive. The smirk was gone. Some kid in a holding cell hung himself this morning. So neither of the main characters in my novel or Christie's novel has anything that you would call a traditional family. Uh, and that's led to certain uh, problems for, for both of them. Uh, major reason my character is drawn to Ted Neal initially, uh, who is on a much, much smaller stage, uh, as charismatic as Jimmy Page, at least I hope so, uh, is that he offers her an opportunity to get outside herself. And I wanted to ask Christy, would you say that's the appeal of music, particularly Led Zeppelin? Clearly, it leads Claudia, Luna's mother, inside herself. But ultimately, it seems to offer uh, Luna a way outside. I'm thinking about the screaming fans who are so outside of themselves when they attend a live concert. How much do our novels have to do with going deeper inside and reaching outward? How do you find your own identity and how does music play in? Wow. A loaded question. Well, first of all, thank you, Lee, for doing this with me. And thanks, Stephanie and Patricia and Malaprops and everybody who's out there. Well, I can't see you, but thank you for being here. Um, yeah, I, I think let me just start with a, a real brief synopsis to orient people. Set primarily in the winter of 1988, Searching for Jimmy Page follows 18-year-old Luna Kane from her family's farm in eastern North Carolina to the UK to, to search for Led Zeppelin's legendary guitarist, Jimmy Page, in the hopes of solving the mystery that her dead mother set in motion when Luna was a child, is Jimmy Page her father? So that's the premise. Um, and I think you're right. I, I think that for Claudia, the music helps her go inward and, and deal with, with what I think is some trauma that happened to her. And for Luna, it, it helps her get outside of herself in a very literal way. It takes her on this journey, um, which her mother was never able to do. Claudia's world was confined to really her home. She never traveled outside of North Carolina. And Luna is able to kind of broaden her, her world and her life in, in doing so. And she's able to, the music is a catalyst for the changes that take place in her life. It's a catalyst for her becoming a writer. And she uses art, and I think we both do in our books. Um, she uses, well, the characters, I should say, not just Luna. I think Claudia does too. 
uses art to kind of heal and to make sense of, of the world. It helps them navigate and create their own personal identities. So I, I wanted to kind of turn this around and ask you, there's some interesting debates between Alex, your character and what a wonderful, your main character, what a wonderful world this could be and her various cohorts about the significance of art and the artist as compared to politics and the politician. And I was wondering, as I was reading your incredible book, what kind of statement you were trying to make about that? I think I was really interested in the relationship between the two, between art and politics. Yeah. The, the artist has an individual vision. And in that sense, artists speak to the politician, to politicians about the significance of the individual, of the right. world. The politicians, uh, and of course, this book is set back in, in a time when we had some illusion that there, there was something altruistic about politics. Right. I don't still have that, that uh, sense anymore. But the, the politician is supposed to be dedicated to the greater good. And certainly the political activists in my novel believe that that's their, their commitment. And they find that to be at odds with the um, individual vision. They think that's selfish. Right. And so really, if I was trying to make a, a statement, it was that they are essential to each other. Without mm -hmm. the politician, you have anarchy. Without the artist, you have no soul inside the group. Yeah, I, I think that was a, a point of convergence between our books. I mean, music is very important in both of our books. And the, the kind of the debate about the role of the artist and the role of art in the characters' lives is a point of convergence in our books, which is why, I, well, first of all, I loved your book so much and, and was really excited about having the opportunity to talk with you about it today. So thanks again for coming on board. Oh, I'm thrilled to be able to talk with you. I loved your novel. Thank you. Um, another question that I, I had was that Luna claims she is not superstitious, but Jimmy Page was influenced by the occult, as we know, as well as by the blues and certain Celtic folk traditions. Luna's great-grandfather, whom we meet on the very first page of the novel, clearly believes in omens, and Luna is named for the moon, which is certainly symbolic. So do you think Luna's view of signs, symbols, superstitions, or omens changes over the course of the novel? I'm not sure that it changes. I, th I think she harnesses it, and, and I, I think for Luna, all of that sort of falls under the umbrella of art. Um, myth and lore, particularly family lore, is important to her in creating her own identity because there are certain things that she's never going to know. And, and, and like I was saying before, like with, with Claudia, she uses art to heal. And all of this for her is a part of the same thing, I think. And she refers to, Luna as narrator refers to Jimmy as a sainted sinner and you know, you mentioned the great grandfather in the story. Well, he's based in name and in, um, in, in the person on my own great grandfather, Jesse Baker. And Jesse, I used to love to hear my grandmother tell stories about him. So apparently, he took a, a mail order class on faith healing and thought that he could heal his wife, my great grandmother Emily, of breast cancer. And it didn't work. And it, that plays out much like it does in, in the novel. But he is he's somebody who's become this, this large figure in my mind, in my family's lore. And so it was a no-brainer that he would show up in the book. Um, but yeah, Jimmy is sort of, he's the shadowy figure. He's not front and center the way Ted is in your book. But in some places, it almost seems like Ted in your book is depicted as a saint of the movement. Um, there are descriptions on him of, of him on pages 265 through 66, 291 that depict him in, in that kind of light. And I'm wondering if, if you saw him as a saint of the movement or as somebody who was more of a, 
a victim or even a perpetrator? Um, I don't see him as a saint. And he tells Alex that he's yeah, not a saint of the of the movement. He, he tells her he's a rich white boy who had an argument with his father and went off to New York and ultimately to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. He's a very privileged background. He goes off to college. His teacher for his freshman Western Civ class is a Marxist intellectual who's active in Students for a Democratic Society. And this sort of revolutionizes his life. Yeah. And so he quits school, he goes off to New York, he goes down to Mississippi for Freedom Summer, the summer that the three civil rights workers were killed in order to um, register Black voters. But he tells her, I didn't go down there to save them, I went there to save myself. Yeah. There's, there's a part of him, he is honestly concerned about racial justice and economic justice. Uh, and he's smart, which is one of the reasons he, as the group um, becomes more and more radical, as the, the movement, the youth part of the movement becomes more and more ra radicalized, he's uh, counseling restraint. But there's one privilege that he can't give up uh, even though he would not be able to articulate it this way. And that is his influence and his charisma. Mm -hmm. um, very handsome guy who has been very charismatic. And because he's counseling restraint as people are getting more and more radicalized, he's losing his influence. Yeah. And Stacey pretty much has him pegged when she says, you know, he needs disciples. He can't mm -hmm. function without disciples. And when he and Alex have an argument that's about something else, but he says, don't you believe me? And she says, no, even though she does, that's it for, for him. Uh, if she doesn't believe in him, then he's lost everything. And so he just completely falls apart. Yes, yeah, so we, we both have these two very charismatic male characters in our books who are <laughs> kind of very influential on the other characters. So it's, it's interesting that we wound up having that point of convergence as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, um, you said in previous interviews that you originally included Led Zeppelin lyrics in your manuscript, but, but couldn't get permission to use them. The lyrics are still very much a part of the novel because the novel essentially, instead of using or quoting the lyrics, inhabits the lyrics. Um, so how much did the writing actually change, change once you learned you would not be allowed to quote the lyrics directly? Not that much. This was such a pain. It was, I, I didn't... I didn't really know that much about having to secure rights for lyrics. I didn't realize it would be so difficult. And on top of that, Led Zeppelin, the re remaining members, the surviving members of the group are very protective, particularly Jimmy. So they don't typically allow permission. They don't typically give permission for this sort of thing. And I just figured, oh, it'll all work out. And so I threw, I had lyrics everywhere in this manuscript. And I remember um, Liza Whelan, bless her heart, read the first full draft and, um, and Margaret Bauer read every chapter in draft form. Thank you, ladies. But Liza read the first full draft and said, ain't no way you're going to have to take these lyrics out or, or at least try and get permission, but it's going to be really expensive. So I, I did fill out all the forms and, and do what you're supposed to do to get permission. Um, I have yet to hear from the publishing company. So we reached a point uh, after it got picked up for publication from Livingston Press. Thank you, Joe Taylor. Um, where we were starting to get close to, to publication and he just basically said, just take them out. And I was crushed. I thought, oh no, that's gonna totally change the whole vibe of the book. I need them. But what I found is See, I had been such a huge fan of this group since I was 15 years old. I had listened to this music over and over and over again until the lyrics are just sort of etched in my head. And what, I, what happened is when I took the lyrics out, I found I could allude to them. I could do creative workarounds. 
so that we didn't have to use the actual lyrics, but I could still get the flavor, the essence of the song. And I, I think it wound up, and Joe said this to me, he said, it, it's a better book because you took them out. So I'm really happy with the way it turned out, but it, it was very frustrating. And, and I know that you've got some lyrics in yours, not much. See, I had them all over the place, but you've got a couple in there. And I remember reading them thinking, this really works well here. It's the perfect lyric for the perfect for the scene. And you know, I wondered if, if you experienced any of that same frustration. Um, now, when early in my career, I taught for 35 years and I taught a course in publishing um, to would be editors. And one of the things I had to teach was copyright law. And that's been a good long time ago. And I haven't gone back and looked at uh, what kind of changes uh, may have occurred, but I just went on the principle of fair use, which used to be three lines. And maybe that's changed, don't tell. <laughs> because if it has, I'm in, I'm in trouble. And, and um, I've, I've already mentioned to Christy, I've got one big error in my, my book that has to do with, with music. Uh, my main character is listening to Layla and there are a few lyrics of uh, fair use, I hope, yeah. uh, of lyrics from Layla two months before it was released in the US. Um, so when I was writing a playlist for Large Hearted Boy, that's, that's how I discovered that and went, ooh, too late now. Oh, well, music is yeah. eternal. It begins before it starts and it never ends. <laughs> now, you use so few lyrics. I'm sure that is covered by fair use. I, I used a lot more than that. So I was going to be in trouble if I didn't take them out. But it doesn't feel as if anything is missing from your book. Well, thank you. Um, you You've said in a previous interview that you were working on a memoir when you decided to return to this novel, which you wrote over time, sometimes long interrupted. And I wondered how much the novel has in common with memoir. There are quite a few things, actually. I, um, I made a trip to England. I've been to all of the locations mentioned in the book. So I made my first pilgrimage, and I do call it that to England in 2005. My, my mother died in 2003, and that was a very difficult time for me. And I, I finally, I reached a point where I had to do something to shake myself out of that grief. And, and it needed to be something out of character. And I'm fairly mild mannered. Um, and I heard about this guitar competition that Jimmy Page was judging with Brian May of Queen. Uh, for in England at Hammersmith Palais and I'd never been out of the country didn't have a passport but I thought well that's it I will go and he had become kind of the gatekeeper he's sort of been a constant in my life um, my brother Steve who's 10 years older was a very good drummer rock drummer in my hometown and he loved Led Zeppelin and particularly John Bonham and so that's how I got into the group so thank you Steve and um I just, I decided Jimmy became sort of the gatekeeper in my healing process. If I could make that journey, if I could somehow make contact and not in an icky way, then maybe I could come back home and, and get myself together. So I, I did go and my intention was to give him part of my MFA thesis that I was working on at the time, which was a very different version of this story and a photograph and asked him to sign it. And so Luna in the story has an envelope she's trying to give him to when she goes to England. And I just froze. I, I had several instances where I was close in, in, in proximity to him, but I was too shocked. So I just stood there. And then finally, when he was about to leave, he came out of the, the backstage room and we were shoulder to shoulder and I didn't say anything. And then his bodyguards are urging him on down the hall and something snapped and I just started chasing him. And I ran down the hall after him and caught up with him at the stairway of all places. And screamed, the only thing that came to mind, Jimmy, I came all the way from America just to meet you. And I, I'll never forget it. He, he stopped and he turned and he looked at me 
And then his bodyguard starts tapping him on the shoulder to continue on down. And he, he smiled and he said, I'm sorry. And so I didn't get to give him the envelope and he left. But in my mind, that qualifies as a meeting. I have met Jimmy Page. So <laughs> that, that went into the book um, or a variation of it. So there are some things that, that are definitely autobiographical. But, but what's that saying that the first novel is, is pretty autobiographical? So there, there are a lot of things in there. Um, Luna does not know who her father is, is not close to her father. I'm close to mine. Um, so there are a lot of things that aren't autobiographical, but, um, but yeah, there, there are several things that are. So um, we're going to take a few minutes and I'm going to read for, I'm just going to read the first chapter because we're kind of short on time here. Um, I'm going to read that and then I think we're going to take some questions. So thanks, thanks, Lee, for your questions. Thank you. This is, this is pretty short. Chapter one. The night my great grandfather died, frigid air howled through the pines and swirled down the chimney of his shack near our fallow tobacco fields in Eastern North Carolina. My grandmother and I kept vigil at his bedside, a battery operated space heater oscillating at our feet, kerosene lamps lofting shadows on the walls. He refused to install electricity and insisted the fireplace remain unlit at night. He claimed spirits talked to him through the flu at the witching hour. So did birds, especially owls. He said they were good omens unless they flew inside your house. Owl in the house means death's coming, he'd say. I lolled my head against the wall, bare like all the others. No family portraits or prosaic artwork or thumbtacked greeting cards with snapshots of my great grandfather's progeny tucked inside. The shack was cluttered with clothes and other debris from a fading life, but the walls were naked. He preferred it that way. No memories or illusions, except the ones that came to him at night. At the stroke of 12, he wrapped his knotty fingers around my wrist and squeezed. Can you hear it? He asked, his voice like winter wind crackling through kindling. An icy shiver ran through me. He had not spoken since that balmy summer night when I was nine years old, when the river ran dry and the pines began to cry. The night my mother committed suicide, an abomination, he'd called it, a sin against providence. He'd sat expressionless in his rocking chair while Grandma delivered the news, his face bathed in candlelight, then hobbled into the woods and chanted my mother's name like an incantation, a prayer for deliverance. And he'd spoken no more. I inched closer to him, close enough to smell the implacable stench of the dying. Hear what? I asked timorously. Owls, he said, like music. My body fluttered, as if I were falling out of oblivion. Slowly, unwittingly, the air prickly and thin. Long ago, I'd heard a song about owls crying in the night. The singers wail primeval, and sync with marauding guitar licks, the beat like jungle drums. I felt them vibrating inside me just then, like a distant echo from another life, one that still included my mother. Can you hear the music, he persisted, struggling to raise his head. Grandma implored me with her eyes. I can hear it, granddaddy. He gave a shuddering laugh. Ain't in your head, girl. Where then? I waited watching his chest rise and fall, his fitful breast grow shallow, the caesura between life and death. It's in your soul, he finally said. He nudged his Bible beside him, giving voice to verse. Ecclesiastes 610, that which hath been is named already. He dropped my arm and exhaled, his face pallid and drawn. Grandma and I stood over him, bearing witness, sleep pelting the windows, that song about the owls, its searing guitar haunting me like fragments of memory I buried with my childhood. Grainy images of my mother in her yellow bedroom with her lavender incense and votive candles, her black and white photograph of a rock star standing on a stage at Kezar Stadium in 1973, dressed all in white, lips pursed, unruly dark hair framing a beatific face, guitar strapped over his shoulder. 
arms spread wide as if he were awaiting crucifixion. The two of them were intertwined in my mind's eye, like ashes wafting in a summer wind, waiting for water to receive them. I was born of water and moonlight, and of her, and of him. Grandma stopped the clock on the mantel to mark the moment of my great-grandfather's passing, as if halting time held power, then forever now. She handed me a flashlight, then draped her overcoat around me, the scent of Jurgen's lotion and talcum powder lingering in the fabric. Go on home, honey, she said. I shouldn't have brought you here. You didn't, I said faintly. I'd followed her from our farmhouse at dusk, trudged the quarter mile past the barn and hog pen through the woods where the footpath ended, as if I'd heard my great-grandfather's keen call. Go home, Grandma said, prodding me toward the door. I'll be along directly. I wrenched away from her and stared at my great-grandfather, the withered shell that remained, searching for some part of him that still looked vital, the outline of his body beneath the quilt. Legs splayed as if the cat he used to own were nestled between them, his arm dangling over the side of the bed. Grandma tucked it underneath the quilt her mother had made, tattered and yellowed with age, the same quilt that had covered her while she lay dying over half a century before, cancer ravaging her breast, flies swarming the window screens, attracted by the fetter of rotting flesh, all because her husband had believed he could heal her with ritual and prayer. I harbor a picture of that night in my mind's eye, my great-grandmother's bewildered stare, her mouth a perfect O, oh, a last word half spoken, an oracle undelivered. Now he was dead, his jaw unhinged, spittle on his grizzled chin, his only child by his side, the daughter whom he only recognized after she'd tell him her name, the name he'd given her 70 years ago. Do like I say, Grandma said sternly. I stood there breathless, my great-grandfather's milky eyes, fixed and dilated, seeing nothing, seeing everything, boring into mine. Grandma cupped my chin in her hand. Don't look back, she said, with urgency in her voice. I never had before. Not after my mother died. Like my great-grandfather, I had not spoken her name since. I had not heard her voice in a brooding summer rain or felt her hand clasping mine in a sibylline dream, or seen her face in the shadow of a stealthy hunter's moon. I had erased her, and the sainted sinner who conjured music and magic from an electric guitar, his photograph in my mother's bedroom, her unfaithful talisman. I'd never looked back, never, until that winter's night in February 1988, when I was 18 years old, the past summoned like fire in my great-grandfather's shack, phantom owls crying in the night. It was inevitable. Perhaps it was even providence. Now it would return me to then. The tale demanded to be told. Thanks everybody. <laughs> Stephanie, were you gonna, or Patricia, were you gonna take some, some questions? Hi, yes, thank you. Thank you both so much for reading and um, for questions you pose to each other. Um, it's been great to hear you both talk about, talk about your books. Um, so we do have a couple of questions from the audience. I need to start uh, with two questions uh, from me uh, in the hopes that there are people in the audience who also wanna hear the answers to these questions. Um, first of all, I need to point out your earrings, Christy, <laughs> in case uh, anyone hasn't noticed that you are wearing guitars in your ears. Um, so thematic and Amanda and Meredith Campbell for the earrings. Thank you for the Demi Page cutout and for the crazy display in my living room. Well, the cutout was going to be my next question. So, <laughs> um, and I think I cut you off there a little bit. If you want to repeat the, the last part after the, after you talked about the display. Oh, just the my two best girlfriends in the world, Amanda and Meredith Campbell, have a key to my house. And so while I was off in New York last weekend on the book launch, they came in and worked their magic. And, and when we came back and walked into the, the house, there, there are these, there's this amazing balloon activity going on over the, the fireplace and cutouts of Jimmy Page and, 
and the earrings and all kinds of things. And so everyone should, should have friends like these two women. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Love the cutout. Uh, thank you for, for sharing that. It's, it's, it's nice to have Jimmy there with you in spirit, I imagine. So um, coincidentally, the first question is from Amanda Campbell. Um, And Amanda says, I'm fascinated by this kind of writing. It sounds so research dense. I'm curious, what is the writing process like for you both? Do you revisit locations you want to include in your novels? Do you take notes as you travel? How do you decide? How do you decide what to include and what to leave out? That's actually a few questions, but it's a it's a great collection of questions. Well, they know the the history of all my trips, and um, I've been to some of the loca- some Led Zeppelin locations that didn't make it into the book, like Bron Yar, where which was the inspiration for Led Zeppelin three, but I. I went to all of the locations in the book, like Jimmy's houses, Tower House, Old Mill House, where John Bonham died, which is in Windsor, uh, Alistair Crowley's former house, and Jimmy owned it for a while too, near Inverness, and Headley Grange, which was where the fourth album was largely recorded. So the re- physically going to all of those places made a huge difference in fleshing out the scenes that I use those locations in, and, and hopefully getting it right, because it, it was more than just what I would read online about these places. There, there's a vibe that like going to John Bonham's grave um, in, in my own story, when I went, his sister showed up. And so it was the two of us, nobody else was, there's a small cemetery outside Kidderminster and his sister showed up and I, I remember we were just two women talking about our brothers who were drummers. I didn't hear wild stories about Bonzo the rock god. I heard about the big brother, John, and I talked about my big brother, Steve, and it, it was a wonderful moment. So yeah, the, the uh, field research for me was crucial. And, and I would love to hear Lee's take on research from her book because photography, she, she just, goes into so much detail, wonderful detail about the process of of photography and the art of it. So I'd love to hear what she's got to say about that. Um, Making my character a photographer was, I thought initially going to be a convenience. My first novel was about a clarinetist, something that I really know nothing about. So I had to do an awful lot of research, hang out with musicians all of the time, ask them crazy questions like when you play the violin, does it hurt your neck Uh, and and so on. And uh, I I know photography. Uh, I've been torn all my life between photography and and writing, although Alex, my character, is a much, much better photographer. Than, than I am, and a much different kind of photographer. I'm primarily a, a nature photographer, but there was a long time in my life back in the days of, of film when I spent a lot, a lot of time in dark rooms uh, and working with film, working with printing and so on. So I thought, this is a shortcut. You know, I don't have to learn all this stuff. I already know all this stuff. But then I had to learn all the political stuff because I was outside of that. I fictionalized, I think in a way it was a mistake, but I fictionalized the um, main town, uh, Limestone. It's really Bloomington, Indiana, and Wallace University, which is a private university in the novel, is actually based on Indiana University, which was my undergraduate school. Uh, so those were places I, I knew. I taught at Princeton for a year and have spent a lot of time in New York. Because I'm uh, trigger happy with the camera, uh, I take lots of just documentary pictures wherever, wherever I go. Uh, I lived in Richmond, Virginia, Uh, which is also a setting in the book for a few years. And I went back to Richmond and just took tons and tons of pictures, not art type pictures, but just records. 
so that I could consult the pictures. I did the same thing with, with New York. I didn't have to do that uh, for Bloomington because I had fictionalized it and also because I'd spent eight years there and uh, pretty, pretty much knew it during the time that Alex was, uh, was there. So to uh, thank you both for that, first of all, and then to the, the last question that Amanda asked, how do you decide what to include and what to leave out, uh, which is a, a great question. We'll start with you this time, Lee. Um, I think it's a good idea to put everything in and then take out as opposed to the other way around. I'm afraid I don't always follow that advice. I don't always work that, that way, but I, I do tend to edit out more. Uh, and part of it is you edit out repetitious stuff. You edit out stuff that you think is implied. Uh, you, you write it initially because you're not sure it's clear, but then after you've worked through several drafts, you get the feeling that, okay, I, I think this is really subtext and doesn't need to be part of, of the text. So it's, it's basically an intuitive process for, for me, but it is much easier to take out than it is to put in because when you're inserting you've got to somehow pick up the rhythm uh you're you're always kind of fooling around with the pacing and the rhythm and it's just much easier to get that right when you're striking lines and striking paragraphs than it is when you're putting them in mm -hmm. christy i would say ditto and then i would add the more you get to know the characters, the more they sort of dictate, or for me anyway, the direction that the story needs to go in. And it could be that you've got something that you sort of planned to go in and you realize that, that the character wouldn't do that. That's not, that's not going to work. And in, in some cases, like I had that experience with John Bonham's sister in, in the graveyard, Luna goes to John Bonham's grave and there was no way I could make that work in fiction. It was just too coincidental, too convenient. And, and I thought it would never play well. So that's uh, interesting that, that a real thing right. that actually happened yeah. would re, you, you felt would read false. I did. I, I mm -hmm. thought no one's going to buy this. That's just too convenient. So I, I had that moment in the graveyard be with just Luna. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, so it's, it's a couple of minutes to seven. So, uh, and we did get started a few minutes late. So I'm going to um, ask you one more audience question. Um, and uh, thanks to Victor for asking this one. Um, you both have the advantage of hindsight for your stories. Both are sophisticated about uh, the excesses of rock and roll and the um, pitfalls of the left. Are either or both of you looking to get the past right or to correct any cliches? Gosh, that's that's interesting. Um, I'm, I'm not. I don't think that I've got any any major message, or, or I was on trying to get any perspective across. I, I just wanted to tell Luna's story, mm -hmm. and so no, I, I don't. I don't think there's there's anything that I'm trying to correct about this period in time. I think that's a, a question probably more suited for Lee. I, I would say that I'm just trying to get it right. And I did an enormous amount of research in order to try to get it right. There's something, it may be because I'm a photographer, but there's, there's something documentary at the heart of all of, of my work. Uh, maybe I just have that desire to write Kilroy was here on everything. Um, but uh, particularly with regard to the politics of the 60s, they the whole decade has become such a cliche. And I was very much aware of that as as I was working on on this book. 
and very much wanting to go beyond the cliche and to treat it uh, as it really happened. And I know that there were a lot of young editorial assistants who you could almost hear their hands on their hips when they would say the 60s weren't like that. You know, they were probably two years old uh, when, when the 60s happened. And, and I knew from all the reading I had done, I read numerous um, historical accounts, but also numerous memoirs by figures from inside the, the movement that I was right, um, that it was the way I, I portrayed it inside these local uh, sort of political cells. And, uh, and, I, and I wanted very much for that to, to sort of counteract the cliche that uh, it was just a, a big party. Hmm. Yeah, I think you had a much more difficult job than I on, on that front, because you're dealing with all of this historical period that we're all familiar with. And, and I do think you got it right. I had a lot more license in my story. I mean, I wanted to get the band dynamics right. I wanted to get it. Were they in America at this particular on this month in this year? Did they I wanted to get all of the band facts right and the locations right. But beyond that, I had much more freedom in terms of, of telling the story and the time period. So I'm very impressed with how you handled all that. And it was clear you did your homework. Well, I, th I think the big thing for me is that people look back on the 60s now and they conflate the uh, new left with the hippies. And those were very, very different groups. Right. And the hippie cliche is what's kind of taken over. Right. And I, I very much wanted to... Um, I don't want to say correct that because that sounds like uh, you, you write a novel in order to um, make a moral point. And that's not really what I do. But I, I was very aware of wanting to make that distinction clear. Well, thank you so much. And Victor, thank you for that, that question. Um, I, I would like to go ahead and end. This is going to be... Um, uh, because of our, our sort of technical issues, we didn't give you advance notice. So it's it's fine to say, gosh, I don't know. But something we like to invite authors to do is recommend other books um, for the folks in the audience, in addition to each other's, which you obviously love and highly recommend. Um, and I will just go ahead and, and remind folks um, that we encourage you to um, purchase uh, both of the books that you've heard about this evening. Um, and, uh, but if you have any other thoughts, either something that you just read and, and really loved or something that's always been a favorite um, that you think folks should read, uh, Christy? Sure, I, I feel really lucky that I'm, I'm going to, well, first of all, it was great to read with Lee and I love her book. Um, Jeff Jackson, who wrote Destroy All Monsters, colon, the last rock novel. I love his work, can't recommend him enough. Beth Gilstrap has a, a collection of short stories out, Deadheading and other stories, and I'm reading with her. Or, or at, we're actually doing just a meet and greet at Quail Ridge Books in a couple of weeks, I think. So those are two books in particular that I would recommend. Megan Lucas has a good book. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll go with those, those three for right now. Excellent. I'll, and we've, we've hosted all of those authors. Um, there's a video of, of Beth Gilstrap's uh, a conversation with Stuff Post on our YouTube channel. I'll just put in a plug. Y'all can check it out if you weren't there. Um, and uh, and Megan Lucas is, uh, lives right in the area here yeah. uh, as well. So thank you for that, Christy. Lee, what about you? I'm about to begin uh, the new Anthony Doerr novel, uh, Cloud mm -hmm. Gouland, and I'm really looking forward to that because I loved uh, his previous novel, so, so much. Um, Jill McCorkle's novel, Hieroglyphics, which came yeah. out earlier this, this year, is really, really excellent. Uh, I enjoyed uh, Bobby Ann Mason's Dear Anne, 
very, very much. Also a book set in the, the 60s. And I uh, read and had a conversation with her uh, on Zoom for Quail Ridge er earlier this, this year. Um, so those are some of the, the things that, that I would would recommend. Uh, I just read uh, also Minrose Gwynn's memoir mm -hmm. um, title just flew out of my head, but her memoir is just wonderful. Searching for Snow, I think, or Waiting for Snow. It's uh, really, really a fine book. Excellent. Um, we've also recently hosted uh, Jill McCorkle for Hieroglyphics, and that was another wonderful conversation uh, with Lee Smith. Um, I think that was with Lee Smith. Um, we've, we've seen Jill a couple of times, so um, you can look for that as well. Um, and I, I just want to point out, because this came up in a previous event, that there was a, there was a national uh, article recently about Southern writers um, that focused on some really wonderful writers, um, but they were all men. Um, and, and, you know, that there are, there are certain names, you know, that, that have, you know, that traditionally have been and continue to be sort of go-to names when you think of Southern literature um, that tend to be male names. And I just want to point out that you both just very easily mentioned several Southern writers who are women, and there are many more where that came from. Um, and so we just, you know, um, uh, just wanted to point that out and acknowledge it and encourage folks <laughs> right. to, um, you know, to, to read widely um, <laughs> and, um, and, and to recognize, you know, that there are um, so many people writing. Um, and in addition to the wonderful male authors that we see, there are all these wonderful female authors, all these wonderful Southern authors of color, Southern queer authors, all of these, you know, authors who, especially when it comes to, to, you know, quote unquote, Southern writing, those, those images don't spring immediately to mind, even though um, folks fitting different descriptions have been Southerners the whole time <laughs> and writing the whole time. So, uh, so thank you for that because that was completely organic and just, um, <laughs> just made, made the nice point. So um, it's been great to have you both here this evening and to hear from you. And um, again, want to encourage folks to pick up their own copies of Searching for Jimmy Page by Christy Alexander Hallberg and What a Wonderful World It Would Be by Lee Zacharias. Um, thank you for being with us and thanks to everyone who's been with us live this evening or if you're catching the video later, thank you for watching. Thank you so much. Thank you. Stephanie, Patricia, Lee, Malaprops, everybody, thank you very much.